A comfortable abode with a gorgeous view of the Mediterranean Sea will serve as a perfect rain shelter. Well, this is what a real estate advertisement might have looked like for Neanderthals 100,000 years ago. Welcome to the weird and wonderful caves you could live in. Or not. Of course, back then, neither real estate and advertising had been invented yet. Never mind the fact that Neanderthals couldn't build houses and often lived in caves. Yet, one of those caves looks an awful lot like a residential building. It's situated inside a high limestone cape called the Rock of Gibraltar. If the Neanderthals had had an economy, the caves inside this rock would have cost a bundle. Navigators discovered it in 1907. They just spotted a big hole inside the fortified rock. For many years, scientists have studied this place and found some traces of Neanderthals. They discovered ancient tools in the cave and bones of old animals. But the coolest thing was, they found four caves inside the rock. It was like a residential complex. Neanderthals lived alongside neighbors and helped each other hunt and fish. They created feather decorations and painted abstract drawings on the walls. Imagine our ancient predecessors hanging out in these caves 100,000 years ago. And now, scientists hang out there and study the primeval past of Neanderthals in detail. At the end of 2021, archaeologists uncovered a gap inside one of the caves leading to an unknown tunnel. They crawled through this hole and opened a new space under the cave roof. This place has been closed off from the outside world for over 40,000 years. And it seems it was one of the most prestigious apartments in the entire mountain complex. It has high ceilings with ancient stalactites. The ruined stone curtains divided the apartment into several rooms. Scientists also found the remains of ancient animals and scratches on the walls. It seems that Neanderthals had never lived here, but they used to visit this place. Archaeologists found the shell of a sea snail called dog whelk. One of the Neanderthals brought it here for some reason. But the primary owners of this place were hyenas. These caves show that Neanderthals were closer to humans than to monkeys. They had a way of life and even some customs. There's still a lot of work ahead, and scientists hope to find new rooms inside this rock. Meanwhile, in 2003, archaeologists discovered another early dwelling on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia. Among the green jungle, they found a cave with ancient tools. At first, everyone thought the human ancestors lived here. But then, scientists discovered an unusual skeleton of an adult. A thorough analysis showed the skeleton belonged to a 30-year-old woman, three and a half feet tall, just above the waist of an average adult. The woman's weight was equal to the weight of an adult shepherd. The skeleton didn't belong to Neanderthals or Australopithecines. It was a new unknown species, which scientists called Homo floresiensis, or simply the hobbit. Also, there were remains of unusual ancient animals in the cave. It was an elephant the size of a cow, some large storks, and giant rats. Archaeologists have found out that hobbits were not the owners of this place. The main inhabitants were the rats the size of a cat. Maybe they were fighting the hobbits. Some analysis shows that Homo florensiensis wasn't our direct ancestor. They were in a separate branch of evolution. The hobbit skeleton looks more like that of a monkey than of modern humans. In 2009, in the dense jungle of Vietnam, archaeologists discovered San Don, the largest cave in the world. If you go inside the cave and shout, you'll hear your echo a long time. In some places, the height of this cave reaches half the height of the Empire State Building. And the total area is larger than one central block of New York. Sun Don is one of the three caves in the Vietnamese jungle. Many intricate mazes connect these caves. Inside, you can find unique plants and trees that live separately from the outside world. It's a real underground jungle. In some places, you can find collapsed ceilings that let the sunlight in. Besides unusual trees and plants, ancient stalactites hang there. Some limestone deposits are more than 450 million years old. They were here even before dinosaurs appeared. There are also many rivers in the cave. Rainwater coming down from holes in the ceiling has formed them. Fast streams resemble slides in a water park. They lead to unknown underground labyrinths. Scientists have studied only a small part of all these caves. The next unusual cave is in New Zealand. Hundreds of thousands of fireflies live inside. 
Each of them glows with a blue light. Together, they light up the cave. It may seem to you that you're on another planet, but you can't stay there for a long time. Special air measuring devices are everywhere. Scientists monitor the level of carbon dioxide necessary for the normal existence of fireflies. These insects are sensitive to the environment. If there are many people in the cave, or they stay there too long, the park staff will ask them to leave the place. It's like you're literally stealing oxygen from the fireflies. We've seen some pretty amazing caves so far, but how about a scary one? We're going to the desert of Yemen's Almara province. What we're looking for is not a cave, it's just a black hole in the ground right in the middle of the desert. It's big, the size of a basketball court. It's not its size that can scare you, but what's inside. Scientists are still not sure what it is. From the depths of this black abyss, a disgusting smell of rotten eggs constantly comes out. And sometimes, you can hear some strange, frightening sounds. The blackness of the giant hole in Yemen absorbs all the sun's rays, so you won't see what's there even with a powerful flashlight. People flew over this place by helicopter. They filmed using drones and the most powerful lenses, but they didn't catch anything except darkness. It looks like a big ink spot in the middle of golden sand. The locals are afraid to approach this place. They believe the cave leads to another dimension where evil creatures live. At the moment, the giant hole in Yemen is one of the most poorly studied and mysterious phenomenon of nature. How did it appear? How old is it? Where does it lead? Scientists are trying to find the answers to these questions. There are theories that the hole appeared because of construction work. Geologists drilled the soil nearby in search of minerals. It could have caused fluctuations in the Earth's crust and collapsed the surface. But no one can prove this theory. Yet. And now, imagine a place where sunlight has not penetrated for more than 5 million years. There's little oxygen, and it's cold and damp. Still, life is born in this place. Not only microbes and bacteria, but also something bigger. The living conditions in this cave are very different from the usual ones. So, in a sense, this cave is like another planet. It's the Movil Cave in the southeast of Romania, near the Black Sea. The entrance is a small hole in the ground. Inside, a tunnel leads deep below the surface. The levels of hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide are above normal inside the cave. The air here is half as much oxygen as on the surface. People can't be here without an oxygen mask. But other creatures living here can. The cave is home to 48 species of living organisms. 33 of them are unknown. Here, you can meet some unusual insects white snails and white spiders, millipedes with huge whiskers, transparent shrimp, and unique species of leeches. They all live here thanks to the little bacteria autotrophs. They absorb carbon dioxide and release food particles. Bacteria feed on it. Other larger organisms feed on these bacteria, and some bigger organisms eat those little ones. In the end, everyone gets food. In this cave, evolution has created a biological system separate from the rest of the world. You're way more Neanderthal than you think, at least when it comes to your DNA. These ancient hominids were shorter and stockier than humans today. They made stone tools, used fire, wore clothing, and had some rituals of their own. The official theory says that they went extinct 40,000 years ago. But a new study says Neanderthals probably never really disappeared completely, but could have mixed with modern humans. It looks like every modern human has about 3% of the Neanderthal genome in their DNA. If it's accurate, it means Neanderthals were more connected with our ancestors than we previously thought, and shared a long history of living together. Neanderthals were very close relatives of modern humans. But our families separated about half a million years ago. More than 10 years ago, scientists discovered that Neanderthals had families with the early humans who traveled out of Africa. Because of this, people living outside of Africa today have about 1-2% to of Neanderthal DNA in their genes. We now have only three really good examples of complete genetic code from these ancient hominids. The first one comes from bones found in a cave in Croatia that are 50,000 to 65,000 years old. 
Two more examples, which are about 80,000 and 50,000 years old, were found in caves in Eurasia. Scientists still aren't sure as much about how modern human DNA got into the Neanderthal genetic alphabet because they don't have enough material to study. But they did compare the existing DNA of three Neanderthals with the DNA of 2,000 modern humans. They found that the Neanderthal DNA might be made up of up to 3.7% of modern human genetic code. It means that in the ancient Neanderthal population, about 1 in 30 parents were modern humans. The scientists found that modern human DNA got mixed into the Neanderthal genetic alphabet during at least two periods when humans and Neanderthals were interbreeding. This happened once about 200,000 to 250,000 years ago, and again about 100,000 to 120,000 years ago. There might have been other times they mixed, but we can't see those in the DNA we have now. Another recent study, which hasn't been fully checked by other scientists yet, says that most of the Neanderthal DNA in modern humans came from one big period of mixing, about 47,000 years ago, that lasted for almost 7,000 years. Scientists found skulls that are about 100,000 years old in two caves in the Middle East. These skulls look like they belonged to early modern humans, but have some features like bigger eyebrows that might show they had Neanderthal DNA. This could be because of gene flow from Neanderthals, and it fits in the mixing time frame. The study also looked at the genetic differences in the three Neanderthal genomes and found out that Neanderthals had an even smaller population than scientists thought before. It could be another proof that Neanderthals didn't just go extinct, but became part of the modern human gene pool. Many groups of modern humans left Africa and mixed with Neanderthals so much that Neanderthals couldn't stay separate. In the future, scientists want to study how modern human DNA affected Neanderthals. This could help us understand if this mixing had good or bad effects on Neanderthals. Neanderthals aren't our only relatives from the past. There used to be at least nine species of humans on our planet. One of them, Homo habilis, earned the nickname Handyman because stone tools were found with its remains. It lived in eastern and southern Africa. This early human had a slightly larger brain than its older relatives and an ape-like face. Homo habilis was about four feet tall and ate a variety of foods. For a long time, scientists thought Homo habilis was the oldest member of our human family. But new dating methods have shown that Homo erectus, another ancient human, might be older and not related to Homo habilis. Homo naledi is a more mysterious member of our human family discovered in a South African cave in 2013. It's the only region of the world where their remains were found. They walked on two feet but were also good at climbing trees. They were small, about 4 feet 9 inches tall, weighed around 88 pounds, and had small brains. We don't know much about how they lived since we haven't found stone tools or other cultural evidence. But some scientists think they might have buried their deceased and made cave art. In 2010, scientists found some fossils in a cave in Siberia, but they weren't sure what species they belonged to. These fossils are from a group called the Denisovans, who lived between 194,000 and 51,000 years ago. We don't know much about them because we only have a few fossils, but DNA analysis has shown that Denisovans were closely related to Neanderthals and modern humans. They even had families with early humans, especially in Southeast Asia. There aren't enough fossils to give Denisovans their own species name, but their genes are found in modern humans which means they might be part of our own species. As scientists study more about Denisovans and fossils in Southeast Asia, we might understand better how different species fit into the Homo family tree. In 2003, they found fossils of a very small human-like species in a cave on the island of Flores in Indonesia. These tiny people lived between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago. They were only about 3 feet 6 inches tall. Scientists think they might have come from another species, Homo erectus, and became smaller over time because they lived on an island with limited food. 
Because of their small size, they're often nicknamed hobbits. Around 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, yep, that's us, were the last humans left out of many different kinds of human-like species that walked on two legs. So, the logical question is, what happened to the others? And what did we have to do with their disappearance? Some scientists think we survived because our offspring lived longer or because we were better at handling changes in the weather. Others think we might have competed with other human species or maybe mixed with them and shared genes. About 300,000 years ago, the first Homo sapiens lived in Africa. They didn't look exactly like us, but they were more similar to us than other early humans. They had tall, round skulls with almost straight foreheads. Unlike Neanderthals, they didn't have thick brows or jutting jaws like Homo naledi. They also had chins, which no other early humans had, though we still don't know why. Homo sapiens lived in bigger groups and had more genetic diversity compared to other early humans. This helped us in many ways, not just in staying healthy. Having big social networks across different places was like having a safety net. If we ran out of food or water, we could go to other groups we were connected to, and they would help us because we weren't strangers, we were family. These big networks also helped these early humans share new ideas and inventions. A big simulation showed that later species of humans could live in many different environments because of these wide networks and the ability to adapt. We know that Neanderthals were really smart, but Homo sapiens might have been just a little bit smarter. Small inventions like weaving and sewing needles could have given Homo sapiens an edge. Scientists have found evidence of weaving from 35,000 years ago and sewing needles from 30,000 years ago. Weaving lets you make things like baskets and nets to catch food. Sewing needles help you make better clothes and tents, which keep you and your youngsters warm and safe, which is very important for survival. Remember the Neanderthals? Our superstar humanoid cousins of the Pleistocene era in all their wide-nosed and slope-foreheaded glory? They roamed through Europe and Asia for over 350,000 years before they vanished. This was around the same time our ancestors, the Homo sapiens, decided to take a vacation from Africa and explore the world. We may never know what truly happened to the Neanderthals and why they didn't make it to the present times, but thanks to some hefty archaeological digging and impressive fossil finds, we now know a bit more about them. One theory for their disappearance is that the climate wasn't suitable for them anymore. Supporters of this idea think Mother Nature turned on the Neanderthals and sent them packing. Unfortunately, if we look at Neanderthal archaeological sites in Italy, for example, there are no signs of weather catastrophes that could have wiped out this entire species. Others believe there was a bit of resource competition between Neanderthals and humans. That's why specialists also dug around several other archaeological sites where Neanderthals and sapiens might have rubbed elbows for about 3,000 years. In this case, it does seem that the Neanderthals were a bit behind with their tools. Their technology was like flip phones in the age of VR. But who knows if these two species ever crossed paths in that particular region. The evidence is still fuzzy. How they went extinct isn't the only information we're curious about when it comes to Neanderthals. Other scientists, for instance, are trying to decode some of the Neanderthal molecular barcodes to identify their specific traits, some of which you might share, believe it or not. Sure, Neanderthals as a whole species did, in fact, go extinct. But that's not to say remnants of their DNA can't be found in humans. Now you know how things go when folks live near each other. Some genetic mixing was bound to happen. The evidence? A dash of Neanderthal DNA which was found in modern folks. Now, this is where the plot thickens. Scientists thought that since Neanderthals never lived in Africa, their DNA wouldn't be found in modern African populations. Well, it turns out that African people have about 0.5% Neanderthal DNA too. This doesn't mean our Neanderthal relatives simply teleported through African territories without leaving any trace behind. What this discovery actually implies is that early humans might have visited Europe, mixed their genetic material with that of Neanderthals, after which they returned to Africa. That's a lot of migration. How did we stumble upon that Neanderthal DNA these days, you might wonder? Well, scientists gathered thousands of people from all around the world, 
Participants came from places like East Asia, Europe, South Asia, America, and Africa. Percentages may vary, sure, but around 20% of the good old Neanderthal DNA is still found in U.S. modern folks. Sure, the average Joe only carries about 2% of that caveman swagger. If you're from certain places or families that have a smidge more Neanderthal in their gene soup, you're looking at 3% tops. Is there anything in particular that we share with our long-gone humanoid cousins? As it turns out, our Neanderthal ancestors gifted us more than just their company for some thousands of years. They also passed down the incredible legacy of their noses. Well, you see, the Neanderthals were outfitted with some seriously high-rising sniffers. These weren't just cosmetic, they were also quite the asset in chilly climates. The icicle-dripping, teeth-chattering kind of cold where your breath could freeze before it leaves your lips. During those days, the Neanderthal noses worked as personal heaters, warming and humidifying the cold, dry air they inhaled. For that kind of extreme weather, these impressive nasal skyscrapers turned out to be quite handy. When our Homo sapiens ancestors decided to leave the sunny savannas of Africa for a spot of frostbite up in Eurasia, they bumped into the Neanderthals. This encounter resulted in not just an exchange of pleasantries, but also an exchange of genes that coded for larger noses. This newfound genetic nugget was discovered by scientists who dug deep into the DNA of over 6,000 volunteers. To complete the study, these scientists meticulously compared this genetic data to snapshots of the volunteers' faces. They measured the distances between various points on each face, such as the height of the volunteers' nose bridges. They then played a game of spot the genetic marker to identify if certain facial traits were linked with specific genes. By the end of this exciting chase, they hit the jackpot 33 shiny new genome areas were linked to facial features. One standout gene, named ATF3, was traced back to our Neanderthal ancestors and seemed to be the maestro of controlling nose height. Participants with Native American ancestry had Neanderthal hand-me-downs in this gene, contributing to their taller noses. Think of the ATF3 gene as a Neanderthal housewarming gift to us humans as we stepped into colder climates from Africa. Interestingly, this isn't the first time our ancestors have played past the gene. Back in 2021, the same research team uncovered a gene influencing lip shape called TBX15. This gene was a little love note from the Denisovans, another set of our ancient relatives, who lived in Asia and went extinct around 30,000 years ago. Another part of the scientific community believes our Neanderthal buddies had this weird genetic feature when it came to their brains. Is that why they didn't make it? Through this theory, it was suggested that US humans might owe our brainy edge to a quirky gene mutation. This mutation gave our neocortex, that's the smarty pants part of the brain, a little population boom in the neuron department. This amazing gene of ours isn't all that different from the Neanderthal version. It's just one amino acid off. Just like ordering a coffee with one sugar instead of none. This tiny tweak is found in virtually all modern humans. Meanwhile, our extinct relatives, the Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other primate pals, all missed the mutation memo, at least according to the study. Now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Just because we have more neurons doesn't necessarily mean we're geniuses by comparison. But these results do suggest that we might have rewired the brain in a way that gave us a cognitive leg up. Also, it's not all about this lone amino acid difference. It's just a piece of the puzzle. Scientists have previously found a whopping 96 differences between our DNA and that of Neanderthals that could have potentially affected our different outcomes as species. Studying Neanderthal DNA also gave us some insight into their relationships. In fact, we now have some solid evidence of what a Neanderthal family looked like. And surprisingly, it's not really that different from ours. For this study, researchers gathered information from a Neanderthal archaeological site located in Asia. They discovered that one particular family included a doting Neanderthal dad, his teen daughter, and a sprightly young lad who was possibly their nephew or cousin. Part of the group was also an older female relative, maybe an aunt or granny. Now, our young damsel would eventually pack her bags, wave a teary goodbye, and leave her papa's home when she found Mr. Wright. Had she been a boy like her young cousin, she would have been a happy homebody. But worry not, she wasn't stepping into a world of strangers. Her new community likely had some familiar, friendly faces. But how were scientists able to predict the ending of this story? 
By browsing through their gene pool, researchers were able to figure out that the Neanderthal social structure was patrilical. What this means is that most female Neanderthals left their homes when choosing a partner and started a new life with another family. The same research shows that our cave-dwelling clans likely weren't living in isolation either. Families living close by were probably visiting the same rock sampling areas to make their stone tools, the equivalent of a neighborhood hardware store. And when they weren't tooling around, they were busy hunting delicious meals like ibex, horses, bison, and other wandering critters. Scientists, however, were careful to add that this ancient family portrait might not represent the full spectrum of Neanderthal social life. They've kindly asked future archaeologists to get more Neanderthal DNAs on the Ancestry websites. 54,000 years ago, there was one interesting group that lived in caves. A father, daughter, and a couple of other members who were their close relatives. And the cool thing here is that they were the first Neanderthal family we know about. A team of scientists studied ancient DNA from their teeth and bones to learn more about early human society. And this research showed a cool thing. They probably lived in these caves at the same time, together. There were 11 Neanderthals that lived together in one cave and two others from another cave that was somewhere close in the neighborhood. So there were 13 of them, eight grown-ups and five kids. Together with their DNA, scientists also found their stone tools and animal bones. Neanderthals are the ancient human relatives that are definitely the closest ones to us. Their skull was long and flattened if you compare it to the skull of Homo sapiens that's more globular. They also had this specific prominent brow ridge above the eyes. You can easily recognize them by their face too, with the central part of the face protruding forward. Plus, they had a large, broad nose. Some believe their nose was a way of adapting to living in cold, dry environments. When the inside of the nose is bigger, it moistens and warms the air you breathe better. Unlike us, they didn't have much of a chin. Also, scratch marks on their front teeth tell us Neanderthals used them like a third hand when they would prepare food and work with materials they used. Their bodies were strong and muscular with wide shoulders and hips. Their average height was 5 to 5.7 feet with a weight of 140 to 180 pounds. Their stocky appearance with short lower arm and lower leg bones minimized their skin surface, better protecting them from the cold. Their lifespan was about 30 years, even though some of them lived longer than that. Neanderthals would dwell in regions that are now Europe and Asia for over 350,000 years. They disappeared somewhere around 40,000 years ago. That's about the time we could find traces of Homo sapiens in Europe. Their families were close-knit groups of 10 to 20. That's a lot less than the population of any ancient or modern human community. It's more like the size of groups of endangered species that are close to going extinct. These Neanderthals lived in their caves with small communities, but they didn't live isolated from the rest of their kind. They relied on each other for survival. They took care of one another, especially those who couldn't care for themselves. Also, their caves aren't as primitive as we might imagine. For example, they had a hole close to hearths and they would probably use it to heat water. Also, they would organize their space. They had sleeping areas, parts of the cave where they could leave trash, and areas where they could make stone tools and prepare their food. They would travel through the river valleys to catch their prey, such as bison, ibex, horses, and other animals. They were skilled in planning their strategies. Some studies showed they were aware of reindeer migration patterns, so they would plan their actions according to their predictions of where their prey could move. One of the biggest animals they would go after was the woolly mammoth. You know them, a relative of modern elephants covered in fur with a weight of up to 12,000 pounds that went extinct a long time ago. And studies show woolly mammoths and Neanderthals shared some genetic traits. It's not that surprising when you think about it. Both species developed from African ancestors before they managed to adapt to the cold, harsh climates of Eurasia during the Ice Age. 
So they faced similar conditions and both went extinct at about the same time. Neanderthals also used stone to make tools, similar to ones other early humans used, such as scrapers and blades made from stone flakes. These tools scientists found in both of the caves they studied are created using the same raw materials. That means the communities probably hung out and interacted with each other in some way. Until the 20th century, many thought that Neanderthals were very different from modern humans considering their genetics, physical appearance, and behavior. But more recent discoveries about this well-preserved Eurasian fossil population have shown that some of the people in it were the same as people alive today. Neanderthals lived before and during the last ice age in some of the harshest places that humans have ever lived. Besides their tools and catching animals, they also gathered plants from around their area. They would also eat cooked vegetables relatively often. Their ability to stay alive for tens of thousands of years during the last ice age is a good example of how humans can adapt to almost any situation. Neanderthals made the earliest cave art that we know about. Scientists explored three Spanish caves where they lived and all of them had black and red paintings of dots, animals, and geometric symbols, together with handprints, hand stencils, and engravings. These paintings were made more than 60,000 years ago. Since Homo sapiens came to Europe 20,000 years after that, we can assume Neanderthals were the only human species on the continent at the time, so they must have been the ones who created this art. Also, these caves were 435 miles apart, so it wasn't like only some of the Neanderthals knew about them. Paintings were obviously their long-lived tradition. They were also big fans of fashion. They made their own jewelry, some of it out of eagle talons. The oldest examples we could find are nearly 130,000 years old. They also most likely used pigment to camouflage or decorate their bodies. Also, Homo sapiens weren't the only species that used fires. Researchers looked at more than 140 fireplace sites across Europe and realized Neanderthals used fire there for a long time too. These signs included charcoal, burned bones, and heated stone artifacts. Neanderthals used fire for cooking food and making tools. They would stick wooden shafts into pieces of stone with pitch, which would be like natural glue. Since burning the bark of birch trees is the only way to make this sticky liquid, the Neanderthals must have been able to control fire. Most people imagine Neanderthals probably grunted, but that's not true in reality. They didn't quite sound like us either. Their big chest, posture, and the shape of their throats probably resulted in a voice that was louder and higher pitched than the average human's voice. They probably didn't have sophisticated vocabularies as we do, but they could use complex speech because they had the hyoid bone. It's this little thing we have in our neck too, the one that supports the root of our tongue. It's the same feature that allows us to vocalize as we do. They were more similar to us than we might expect. Some believe Neanderthals even built boats so they could sail across the Mediterranean. And it's not like Neanderthals lived somewhere, went extinct, and then modern humans showed up. It seems these groups did meet around 100,000 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula or in the Middle East. That's when the first groups of modern humans were moving from Africa. Scientists analyzed the DNA of one of the Neanderthal women that lived more than 50,000 years ago, and it includes genetics from modern humans too. Some traits we have, like skin and hair color, mood and sleeping patterns, are connected to the amount of sunlight we get. Neanderthals lived in Europe and Asia for a long time before modern humans arrived there, so they were used to less sunlight compared to the ones who came from Africa. Neanderthals had different traits because of their exposure to less sunlight, and these traits were passed on to their offspring when they had children with modern humans. In other words, some of the traits that modern humans have today are influenced by Neanderthal genes. For example, people who are night owls often have Neanderthal genes. Also, around 1% of Neanderthals had light skin, 
red hair, and perhaps even freckles. Admit it, whenever you think about Neanderthals, you picture these large, human-like creatures wandering around, bumping their heads, afraid of fire, and making weird noises. That's really far from the truth. There's actually more Neanderthal DNA in your genome than you know. It's estimated that up to 4% of the DNA of some modern humans can be traced back to Neanderthals. If you have no idea who these people were, let me get you up to speed. The Neanderthal was a species of early humans that lived in Europe and Western Asia as early as 200,000 years ago. As for their appearance, they looked sort of like us, but they were physically stronger. Their skeleton was also more durable and able to cope with the harsh environment. I mean, 200,000 years ago, people didn't live in houses or apartment complexes. So, their bodies needed to be able to survive in the wild. What's even more surprising is that their brain was larger than ours. But did that make them smarter? To answer that question, let's look at how these people lived back then. Neanderthals were hunter-gatherers, meaning they had to hunt and search for food. Back in their prime years, farming wasn't a la mode yet. They were skilled at making tools and objects to protect themselves with, like spears and stone knives. They used these things to hunt animals, yes, but also to make clothing. And speaking of garments, a new study showed that Neanderthals might have been more fashionable than we'd previously suspected. These recent findings show that they may have been skilled in using plants to create yarn. This is based on the discovery of pieces of fabric from over 50,000 years ago in parts of Europe, where Neanderthals used to live. This is really important because it's rare for archaeologists to find perishable artifacts such as plant products. Most of the things we find these days from previous eras are pottery and pieces of rocks and bones because they can better resist the test of time. Researchers used a special microscope to examine a cord fragment made of twisted fibers, which may have been used for a tool or net. Since it looks like they were able to twist plant fibers into making a cord, Neanderthals had probably been much smarter than we thought. It shows that they had great observational skills and were great at picking out which sort of plant was better to use. They also used fires to keep warm and cook food. It looks like Neanderthals were able to make use of flames that popped out spontaneously but were not able to create them consistently. Scientists have looked at some Neanderthal sites and found large amounts of ash. That means they had to constantly maintain a fire because they were unable to start it again if it went out. Other specialists believe Neanderthals did use fire, but they did not necessarily need it due to their physical abilities, which allowed them to handle cold temperatures better than modern humans. So, what did Neanderthals eat? Scientists have been able to get a glimpse into their menu, but that's only because these ancient creatures had this nasty habit. They didn't brush their teeth. If you don't brush your teeth regularly, a film called dental plaque will form on the surface of your pearly whites. Over time, this plaque will harden and turn into tartar or dental calculus, which is a combination of minerals, microbes, and leftover pieces of food. Scientists can use bits of the material trapped in dental calculus on fossils to study what our distant cousins ate and what their lifestyles were like. They can also examine ancient DNA to determine the species of microbes present in the mouth of a Neanderthal. Turns out that those living in Belgium ate mostly meat, including woolly rhinoceros and wild sheep, according to the DNA found in their teeth. On the other hand, the Neanderthals found in the El Cidron cave in Spain had a more plant-based diet, including mushrooms, pine nuts, moss, and tree bark. Other Neanderthals from different locations also showed consistent evidence of eating plants. One of the Spanish Neanderthals even had dental problems, and the researchers found evidence of medicinal plants in his teeth. He may have been trying to treat his pain. Another study performed at the University of York found that Neanderthals had some sort of prehistoric healthcare system. It worked regardless of how bad the injury or illness was. The research suggests that this care was provided out of real concern rather than self-interest. This challenges the stereotypical image of Neanderthals as brutes and selfish creatures compared to modern humans. The study found that many Neanderthals had severe injuries requiring ongoing care, such as massage, 
fever management, and hygiene. One individual who was around 25 to 40 years old at the time of his passing had a degenerative disease that likely severely limited his ability to contribute to the group. Despite this, he was carefully buried, which shows that he remained an important part of the group, despite not being able to contribute much to the daily workload. In case you're wondering, Neanderthals aren't technically our direct ancestors. They're sort of a distant relative, if you'd like. Because some of them lived at the same time as modern humans. We coexisted for thousands of years, with Neanderthals living in Europe and Western Asia, and modern humans spreading out of Africa around 50,000 years ago. There is evidence that the two species interacted and even interbred. That's why some humans today have Neanderthal DNA in their genetic makeup. However, the precise nature of their relationship is still debated among scientists. Despite their physical advantages, Neanderthals eventually went extinct. Some people think Neanderthals as a species were not successful because they disappeared a long time ago, but they actually did very well. They lived in difficult conditions for a very long time, much longer than modern humans have been around. Modern humans have only been around for about 100,000 years or so, and only started living in cold areas about 40,000 years ago. There are many factors that may have led to the extinction of Neanderthals. It is believed that changes in their natural climate and competition with modern humans were two of the main reasons. Neanderthals specialized in hunting certain animals, but when those animals went extinct, they may have struggled to find food. Additionally, modern humans had advantages, such as trade networks and better technology, including sewing needles or bows and arrows, which may have given them a competitive edge. Although there is no evidence of direct conflict between the two species, it is known that they interacted. Some people even believe that Neanderthals did not fully go extinct since their traces of their DNA can still be found in some people. So, what if the Neanderthals hadn't gone extinct? Charles Darwin pointed out that many of the unique traits of humans, like emotions, intelligence, language, and social behavior, can also be seen in some form in other animals. Our closest relatives, such as Homo erectus and Neanderthals, were also quite similar to us. However, Homo sapiens are the only surviving members of the hominin group, which includes around 20 known and potentially many more unknown species of humans and human-like apes. Even if the Neanderthals had survived, they would have probably integrated into society and evolved at the same time as modern humans did. One theory suggests that since they were outnumbered at one point by Homo sapiens, their traits would have eventually merged with ours. Those less advantageous, like their inability to produce fire, would have disappeared over generations. Other theories suggest that maybe they wouldn't have wanted anything to do with us. Looking at our differences rather than our similarities, maybe they would have developed their own communities, choosing to live separately from the modern world. Either way, it's hard to predict how a species that disappeared so many years ago would behave today. But what we do know is that you need to think twice next time you want to call someone acting weird a Neanderthal. Your DNA might make you the Neanderthal in the room. One ice frappuccino for me, please, and with a double shot. Now, I suspect this is something you'd never hear if you traveled 100,000 years ago to check out on your super great-great-great-grandparents. First off, you wouldn't hear anything resembling human speech for a simple reason. The early humans developed a capacity for language about 50,000 years ago. So, to talk to your ancestors, you'd need to use some of the oldest forms of human communication including talking or making sounds, drawing or painting, dancing, acting, and using symbols. For example, if you made some weird noises like grunts or guttural sounds, it would mean you're trying to communicate with your peeps or warn them about something. Another reason why no one would grab ice frappuccino back then is that 100,000 years ago, Earth was going through a serious ice age. Who wants an icy, refreshing drink in the middle of winter? It wasn't quite a full-blown glacial period, but it was definitely way colder than it is now. The sea levels were low, and there were glaciers everywhere. 
which made it super tough for our early human ancestors to get around. Some even kicked the bucket while trying to migrate to other areas, especially up in Northern America and Europe. Back in the day when humans were still figuring out this whole survival thing, they chowed down on some pretty, you know, fancy stuff. We're talking tartar steak, sashimi, you name it. Okay, I'm exaggerating a bit. It wasn't an iconic fresh dish, but raw meat. Not a Japanese cuisine stable, but a plain fish. There weren't Michelin restaurants serving fancy dishes and Gordon Ramsay recipes, but prehistoric foodies happily munched on nuts, seeds, and berries. And you know what? Their lifestyle is gaining popularity today. And there's even a so-called paleo diet. Paleo stands for the Paleolithic period. The idea is all about eating like our early human ancestors did. Some scientists believe that our genes haven't quite caught up to the modern diet that came from farming. Thanks to farming, we've got grains, legumes, and dairy galore. But it turns out that these changes in our diet happen faster than our bodies could keep up with it. A hundred thousand years ago, humans roaming around were basically just like us in terms of looks and DNA, but their houses were far from being modern. Actually, those were just caves. They couldn't even buy a mere bed in Ikea. <laughs> Scientists in South Africa just discovered what they're calling the world's oldest bed. And no, it's not a fancy mattress with adjustable firmness settings. It's actually made of grass. Archaeologists stumbled upon mats of grass and sedge that were stacked half an inch thick on the floor of a rock shelter. And get this, the bedding is 77,000 years old. That's like 40,000 years older than the previous record holder. The mats were covered with leaves from a tree called the River Wild Quince, which repels pesky insects. These prehistoric folks were basically having a bed and breakfast situation going on in their cave. But let's be real. Living in a cave is pretty gross. Insects, rot, and lice are just a few of the issues. But instead of bouncing to a new spot when things got nasty, these people burned their bedding and made new ones. Yeah, seems like a hundred thousand years ago, life on Earth was totally wild. Sure, microbes and amphibians were chilling for billions of years before that, but things were way different back then. So during a prehistoric trip, you could have bumped into one of the biggest mammoths ever. Yup, the Colombian mammoth was a beast. Standing at 13 feet tall and weighing over 10 tons, it had curved tusks that were even longer than its body, somewhere over 16 feet. These weren't like those woolly mammoths you see in movies with their thick brown fur. The Colombian mammoths didn't need that kind of coat, because they didn't live in the icy regions of Europe and North America. But don't let their lack of fur trick you. These creatures were massive and could have been a real threat to humans who lived near them even though they were plant eaters. Another beast you'd stay away from is Toxodon. This land animal had some seriously cool curved teeth that gave it its name. It looked like a rhino but with some similarities to rodents too. The last one was spotted only 5,000 years ago, and that's pretty recent in the grand scheme of things. Charles Darwin even used the Toxodon as an example to explain evolution and anatomical differences. Some people think it might have been semi-aquatic, but its grass-eating habits suggest otherwise. Not only was the Earth full of cool animals, but it also had a diverse human population. There were all sorts of new species popping up left and right. And they were on the move, looking for a better place to call home than Africa's dry and dusty areas. One of those species was Homo floresiensis, aka the hobbits. These little guys were only about 3 feet tall and hunted for their food using stone tools. They were totally unknown until recently when scientists found their remains in caves all over the world. 
Homo erectus were the first humans who actually looked like us. They were total trendsetters, standing upright and all. They were the first to explore outside of Africa and check out other continents. These guys were pretty smart, too, making cool tools and even cooking their own food. But unfortunately, they got a little too comfortable and lazy. They didn't keep up with the changing climate and eventually went extinct. It's a shame, really, because while other humans were hustling to improve their tools and survive, Homo erectus just couldn't keep up with the times. Lesson learned, don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone. Homo sapien Neanderthals were basically our ancient cousins who lived in Europe and Asia. They were pretty smart and used fancy stone tools to hunt and survive. But let's not get too carried away with their intelligence, okay? The media likes to hype them up as geniuses, but there's not a ton of evidence to back that up. Modern people are the only non-extinct human species. You and I are part of the Homo sapiens sapiens subgroup that roamed the Earth 100,000 years ago, too. We were so smart that we even migrated out of Africa to Europe and Asia. Our intelligence was apparent from the very beginning. By the way, the era we're traveling in was called the Stone Age, as back then, people learned how to tame stones. That was a tremendously large era that started over 2 million years ago, and it only finished in 3300 BCE. Let's dive into Plombo's Cave. It's a super cool spot located in the Plombo's Private Nature Reserve on the southern Cape Coast of South Africa. The cave may be small, only around 430 square feet, but it's got a big history. Early modern humans were all about Plombo's Cave visiting repeatedly between 100,000 to 70,000 years ago before a sand dune partially sealed the entrance. Above the sand dune, you'll find material from the later Stone Age. The coolest discovery? Two pieces of ochre with geometric engravings that were found in 2002, marking one of the earliest signs of symbolic communication among early modern humans. It's about 75,000 years old. And it doesn't stop there. More engraved ochre pieces have been found in later excavations, proving that this type of communication has been around for ages. Plus, they found red lines of ochre drawn on a rock that dates back to 73,000 years ago, showing that painting was also happening back then. Also, in 2008, they discovered a 100,000-year-old ochre processing workshop with a couple of toolkits at Plumbo's Cave. These toolkits consisted of two abalone shells containing an ochre mixture that was possibly used for painting or other purposes. Our technology has sure made a quantum jump since the first tool ever was invented. But just so you know, it all started with pointed stones in Plumbo's Cave. Yeah, probably the reason why you have the internet today is because some prehistoric dude in Plombo's cave learned how to use pressure flaking and managed to sharpen the very first stone ever. And there were some inventions in between that, but yeah. The profession of a travel blogger is far more ancient than you can imagine. Yeah, the first ones appeared around 2,500 years ago. Meet Herodotus. Historian, travel blogger, genius, billionaire, philanthropist. Just kidding. <laughs> Herodotus had been all over the place, and by the time he hit 60, he had seen more spots than anyone else on Earth. As Instagram wasn't around yet, he had to whip out his papyrus and wrote what we now know as the first ever travel guide, the history. In his book, he spilled the tea on people, places, animals, and plants. He was particularly fond of Egypt. By the way, most of the stuff Herodotus described is still there, so his guide is not that outdated, even today. If you're ever in Egypt, you can actually check out the same monuments and sites Herodotus saw. One spot that Herodotus cruised to was Lake Morris down the Nile. This place was legit, a freshwater lake that got its water straight from the Nile. There was this city called Crocodopolis chilling on its shores. Yep, there were a lot of crocodiles there. That city is also still around today, 
just under a different name, Fayum. Right in the middle of Lake Morris, there were two giant pyramids that took Herodotus's breath away. Here comes the mystery. At the moment, these two pyramids are gone. Seems like, according to the travel guide, we're missing two Egyptian pyramids. Herodotus claimed Lake Morris was man-made, like someone dug it up with their bare hands. He thought so because there were two pyramids smack dab in the middle of the lake. But let's face it, it would have been physically impossible to build something like that in a natural lake. I mean, the ancient Egyptians were pretty advanced, but they definitely didn't have scuba divers and all the essential equipment back then. The pyramids were 50 fathoms above the surface and another 50 fathoms below. Just to give you an idea, one fathom equals six feet. So those pyramids were around 600 feet tall. That's taller than the famous Pyramid of Giza. And while the Pyramid of Giza has a modest little capstone, these twin pyramids had statues of pharaohs chilling on top. That's why you've never heard of them and there are only a couple of drawings depicting them. So what happened? Well, time is ruthless. Take the great labyrinth Herodotus mentioned, for example. Nowadays, it's just a pile of rubble and cobwebs. Even the once magnificent Lake Morris has changed. The water there has turned salty, and now it's just a fraction of its original size. Sure, change is inevitable, but you would think pyramids would stand strong against the test of time, right? Their unique designs make them super durable. So where are these pyramids now? Well, chances are they never actually existed. We all know that some travel bloggers tend to exaggerate, right? Herodotus was no exception. While some people call him the father of history, others call him the father of lies. Ouch! Yeah, his books have false or unverified information sometimes. For example, he totally blew up the size of the Pyramid of Giza in his guidebook. He doubled its size. But hey, cut the guy some slack. In the pre-Google era when our travel blogger lived, fact-checking was pretty complicated, especially for Herodotus who couldn't even read those funky Egyptian hieroglyphics. He had to rely on the locals for info. Those inconsistencies in Herodotus's book might be just one epic prank pulled by mischievous locals on a clueless tourist. Classic! However, there are actually some legit monuments at the site. The pedestals of Bayamu are the leftover bases of two ginormous statues built by the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Amenemhat III. These ruins used to grace the shores of Lake Morris, but now they chill in the Fayum oasis, about four miles north of Fayum city. The first time these statues were mentioned was by, you guessed it right, the Greek historian Herodotus, who was around in the 5th century BCE. Remember the description? Herodotus said there were two pyramids that soared 50 fathoms above the water's surface, and each pyramid had a massive statue sitting on the throne at the top. We have the statues, but not the pyramids. Weird, right? There's an explanation, though. Some scientists believe that Herodotus probably wrote about these statues during a time when the area was flooded. But hey, it's not just Herodotus who spun this tale. Diodorus the Sicilian and Pliny the Elder also jumped on the bandwagon, repeating similar claims about these colossal statues. However, let's not forget that Herodotus might have been a bit lazy. He never actually got up close and personal with the statues. He just saw them from across the lake. So picture this, hazy silhouettes in the distance and Herodotus's imagination running wild with their grandeur. The description matches, except for the height. While Lake Morris pyramids seem to be a myth debunked, there's another mystery waiting to be unveiled. Some time ago, archaeology researcher Angela Mickle dropped a crazy discovery. She claimed to have found not one, but two lost pyramid sites in Egypt. The craziest part is that she didn't even have to leave her couch to find them. She basically found those pyramids online. After spending 10 years studying Google Earth, Angela managed to pinpoint these two areas along the Nile Basin. They're about 90 miles apart and both have some funky shaped mounds. The first one is chilling by the Nile in Upper Egypt, just 12 miles away from Abu Sidum. The second one, 90 miles north, has a 140 feet wide four-sided shape. The second site even has a massive triangular plateau that's a staggering 620 feet wide. 
Angela wrote on Google Earth Anomalies back in 2012, saying that the mound looked super flat on top and had a crazy symmetrical triangular shape that had been worn away over time. And the second site? It got this square center that's totally out of the ordinary for a mound this size. It almost looks like a pyramid when you see it from above. But not everyone is convinced. Some Egyptologists say these mounds are just geological features called buttes. Apparently, they're pretty common in the local Fayum Desert. These buttes form when sediment piles up and there's a stubborn layer that doesn't want to erode. So when the surrounding sediment washes away, that tough layer stays put and makes the hill all flat. Still, this one's just a theory as of now. By the way, Egyptian archaeologists just made one more incredible discovery. This time, it's not a theory, but an actual site. In January 2023, they found a complete residential city from the Roman era right in the heart of Luxor, a southern city in Egypt. This ancient city, dating back 1800 years to the 2nd and 3rd centuries, is actually the oldest and most important city ever found on the eastern bank of Luxor. The archaeologists uncovered a bunch of awesome stuff during their excavations. They found several residential buildings, two pigeon towers that were used to house pigeons or doves, and even some metal workshops. Inside those workshops, they stumbled upon a treasure trove of pots, tools, and Roman coins made of bronze and copper. It's like a real-life time capsule. This kind of find is pretty rare in Egypt. Usually, they come across temples and tombs during excavations, especially on Luxor's West Bank, where the famous Valley of the Queens and Valley of the Kings are located. But this time, it's all about this amazing residential city. And get this, back in April 2021, they announced the discovery of a lost golden city on Luxor's West Bank that's 3,000 years old. The archaeological team called it the largest ancient city ever found in Egypt. It's like they're uncovering hidden treasures left and right. What makes a giant, well, a giant? You know, big, enormous, you get it. Tough questions. It depends on who you ask. The ancient Greeks had cyclops, while ogres were spread out through all sorts of European folklore tales. The tallest person ever recorded was named Robert Pershing Wadlow, and he lived in the first half of the 20th century. He stood at an incredible 8 feet 11 inches tall, but had many medical issues throughout his life. Sadly, he only lived to celebrate his 22nd birthday. That's because Robert wasn't just tall. He had a condition affecting his human growth hormone, which didn't particularly make his life comfortable. Robert even had to wear leg braces in his adult years. During that same time, incredible discoveries were reported in North America. Some people claim to have uncovered weird-looking skeletons, much larger than previously associated with human beings. It immediately raised the question, did giants really used to roam our planet? Our story begins with the idea of a mound builder race. Some scientists back in the day claimed that these massive earthworks in places like the Mississippi Valley, called the Grave Creek Mound or the Great Serpent Mound, were built by some sort of prehistoric type of human, much larger and stronger than us Homo sapiens are today. From around 1812 to the 1860s, almost everyone in America writing about history was covering this mound-building race. However, not everyone agreed with the theory. There was this naturalist named Benjamin Smith Barton, for example, who warned about jumping to conclusions about giants. He believed that just because people discovered some big bones, they shouldn't immediately think of giants. But people didn't listen. Really? They simply wanted to believe about huge human-like creatures, despite not having any real scientific evidence. Newspapers were filled with these giant stories. They described finding giant skeletons, even featuring weird body parts. Con artists took advantage of the whole frenzy, with some putting together skeletons out of wood and rawhide and touring them as proof of the long-lost race of giants. Eventually, in the 1930s, an anthropologist from the Smithsonian took it upon himself to debunk the whole mystery. And his conclusions were straightforward. All those giant skeletons that were supposedly uncovered were either hoaxes or simply animal bones that were wrongly identified as belonging to humans. 
He also said that those who claimed to have discovered ancient giant remains were just not that good with human anatomy. You would think that's how the story ended. Well, it didn't. You see, people became so convinced that giants existed that they simply could not let go. Sound familiar? Because the Smithsonian was investigating these claims, some people started thinking they were up to something shady. They cooked up this theory that the Smithsonian scientists were secretly getting rid of giant bones to hide the truth about giants. This whole story survived through the years and made it all the way to 2014. It's when this internet article said that the Smithsonian used to have tons of giant skeletons but destroyed them back in the early 1900s. And the drama continued. A famed publication even looked into the past of some of those Smithsonian scholars to try and pick apart their credibility. So the institute had to do some damage control. They've since added new people on the team whose job is to figure out if those bones were correctly collected and studied. Now, it wasn't just North Americans that claimed to have stumbled upon giants. The French had their own discoveries, too. Their story takes us back to 1890, when an anthropologist was digging around a Bronze Age site in Castineau, France. What he found were three bone pieces that looked like they came from a giant human. The findings included a massive thigh bone, a shin bone, and a regular upper arm bone known as a humerus. Now, if we put all these bones together and calculate the proportions, they lead us to this towering figure, somewhere between 10 and 11 feet tall. However, in 2022, contemporary scientists took another look at those bones. They concluded they most likely belonged to a cave bear, not a human. It wasn't that unusual for people back in the day to confuse giant animal bones with those of humans. Now, the truth is, our ancestors were in fact taller than we are today, despite them not being technically giants. The average human body has changed a lot over thousands of years. We're not as big and strong as our ancestors were. In fact, we've been on a bit of a downsizing trend, especially in the last 10,000 years. And it's because of a mix of factors. Our genes, the world around us, and how we live our lives all play a role. Way back around 40,000 years ago, European men were towering at around 6 feet. They had a seriously tough life, though, hunting and gathering all day. That lifestyle required a good muscle structure, and their African roots might have given them that extra height, which came in handy in warm climates. Moving on to 10,000 years ago, we can already see a big change in European males. They went down to 5 feet 4 inches on average. What happened was the climate was shifting, and people were increasingly relying on agriculture to provide for their families. It wasn't all sunshine and comfort, though. Sometimes, failed crops and a not-so-diverse food meant a pretty unhealthy diet. Plus, being around farm animals more and more introduced some new medical issues to the mix. We're now around 600 years ago when the shortness continued. And yes, we can still blame it on poor diet and health. However, there seems to be a change in recent years. Today, European males are reaching an average of 5 feet 9 inches. And sure, the fact that we're eating more veggies and getting regular checkups at the doctor did help a lot. But it's also because of industrialization and living in cities. This has brought people from different backgrounds together, which is a good thing it decreases the chances of human passing on genes that could cause problems. So, it's a combination of better living and genetics that's making us taller. We shouldn't give up on ancient giants quite yet, though. You see, experts believe they recently discovered the remains of such a person who supposedly lived in ancient Egypt. Sometimes people can actually grow to large sizes due to a condition called gigantism, the same that made Robert Pershing Wadlow grow to such an impressive height. When some archaeologists were studying ancient Egyptian mummies, they came upon an interesting skeleton. What made it special was that they believed it might have belonged to a pharaoh, who would have been really tall, like 6 feet 6 inches tall. To put that in perspective, that's way taller than Ramses II, who was the tallest recorded Egyptian pharaoh and stood at about 5 feet 9 inches. 
These experts took a closer look at the newly found bones, especially the long ones, and found evidence of something called exuberant growth, which basically means this person's growth was off the charts. It's a clear sign of gigantism, they say. Now, this discovery is important because it makes this mummy the oldest case of gigantism in the world. No other Egyptian pharaohs were known to be giants. It's also fascinating because it tells us something about the health and nutrition of ancient Egyptian rulers. See, those pharaohs were probably better fed and healthier than regular people. Which might explain why they could grow taller than the average person. Now, you might be wondering if being a giant had any drawbacks back then. Well, it's hard to say. I wasn't around then. Still, during those early dynasties in Egypt, they seemed to prefer shorter people, especially in royal service. There are a lot of ancient Egyptian stories featuring short-statured leaders and even higher spirits that locals looked up to. The reason why is still a mystery that we might never fully solve. But since this mummy was found in an elite tomb, it's possible that being a giant didn't have a social stigma attached to it at the time. Maybe he was, in fact, seen as special. Hold on to your hats, folks, because we're about to embark on an incredible journey. With the help of super smart scientists and their studies, we've asked AI to take us back a mind-blowing 2 billion years in time and show us what our awesome Earth looked like. So buckle up and let's find out. Once upon a time, way back when Earth was just a baby, around 4.5 billion years ago, hopping into a time machine and paying a visit would have been a big mistake. The whole place was a hot mess. First of all, the ground was still all gooey and molten, so landing your time machine would have been a major risk. Now, as soon as you tried to get out, you would see a completely different Earth compared to what we know today. The landscape is a patchwork of rugged mountains, sparkling seas, and vast stretches of land. Picture massive volcanoes erupting in fiery bursts, shooting gases and ash into the air. It's like a crazy fireworks show. And even if you had a fancy new machine that could hover and had special shields to handle the heat, you'd still have a hard time breathing. You see, the early Earth's atmosphere is a bit moody. Thick clouds hang in the sky, casting mysterious shadows on the land below. The air is as thin as a whisper and filled with all sorts of interesting gases like hydrogen and helium. Carbon dioxide swirls around, giving everything a vibrant green hue. Water vapor drifts through the air, creating a sense of humidity and a refreshing mist. Oh, and there might be a hint of ammonia and methane just to keep things interesting. Lots of cool gases, huh? But wait, there's something missing. Oxygen. So if you take a deep breath, you won't feel that familiar rush of air filling your lungs. On land, there are no lush forests or towering trees just yet. Instead, you find rugged, rocky terrains. Some of these ancient rocks bear the marks of intense forces, collisions and earthquakes that have shaped the land over millions of years. But amidst all this ancient beauty, something amazing is about to happen. Life, in its early stages, is evolving and preparing for its grand entrance. Simple organisms, like algae and bacteria, rule the scene. They thrive in the oceans, using the abundant carbon dioxide to grow and multiply. The waters are teeming with activity, with colorful, microscopic life forms buzzing around like a busy city. These tiny organisms are working hard, releasing oxygen as they go about their business. They're like little factories, slowly changing the composition of the atmosphere. So this is what the early Earth looked like, more or less. But why was it so nasty? And how could it have changed so much since then? You see, Earth's heat came from all sorts of crazy things happening during its formation. First off, there was some serious heat already packed into the objects that came together to make our planet. Then, as Earth grew bigger and stronger, its gravitational force got a major power boost. It pulled in more stuff, but it also gave Earth a massive bear hug, squeezing everything tightly. And you know what happens when things get squeezed? They heat up like a pressure cooker. This crazy heating had a huge impact on Earth's structure. Picture Earth as a mixed-up bag of rocks, metals, and minerals. But as things heated up, the rocks and metals got so toasty that they melted. And guess what? The denser metal sank to the center and became Earth's core, while the lighter rocky stuff floated up to become the crust and mantle. It was like Earth decided to unmix itself, creating separate layers. Scientists call this wild separation differentiation. 
but the heating didn't stop there. With all this mixing and moving around, Earth got even hotter. It was like turning up the heat in a giant planetary oven. All this crazy heat had some serious consequences. Earth's high temperature made everything super speedy. Tectonic plates were dancing like there was no tomorrow, making the surface super active and full of geological shenanigans. Oh, and that's not all. Earth also got showered by some serious cosmic visitors. Imagine this. While Earth was busy gathering up all sorts of space debris during its formation, the rest of the solar system was causing some major chaos. Saturn and Jupiter decided to shake things up by changing their orbits, sending a whole bunch of massive objects hurtling towards poor Earth. These collisions were no joke. They packed a punch that melted minerals in Earth's crust and even vaporized them. These booms were so intense that they even blew gases right out of Earth's atmosphere. Talk about a wild fireworks show. Believe it or not, we can still spot ancient battle scars from these collisions. It takes some careful detective work, but we can catch a glimpse of their aftermath. For example, there's this place called the Manitsok Crater in Greenland. Even though there's no actual crater to see, we can examine rocks that were chilling 12.5 to 15.5 miles below Earth's surface back in the day. And guess what? They bear the marks of intense and sudden shock. Now that's some tough neighborhood. The wildest collision of them all was with a planet called Theia. Theia, about the size of Mars, crashed into Earth with a mighty BAM! It was a colossal event that changed everything. Theia's metal core fused with Earth's core, while the outer layers of both planets got shattered and tossed into space. The result? A beautiful ring of debris encircling Earth. Now here's the coolest part. That debris didn't just float around forever. It started to come together, like puzzle pieces finding their match. And voila, we got our very own moon. Can you believe it? And this incredible moon-making process might have taken as little as 10 years or even less. Crazy, isn't it? Scientists call this whole moon-forming extravaganza the giant impact hypothesis. So next time you gaze at the moon in the night sky, Remember that it's actually a huge chunk of our own planet. And by the way, Earth also had quite the adventure trying to create its atmosphere. In the beginning, our planet's first attempt at an atmosphere didn't go so well. It had a thin layer of hydrogen and helium that came along with all the stuff it gathered. But those gases were like sneaky escape artists and decided to float away into space. Bye-bye, gases. Luckily, Earth didn't give up. It went for a second round, and this time it was much more successful. Volcanic eruptions came to the rescue. They spewed out all kinds of gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide, and a whole bunch of other funky ones. Even meteorites and comets joined the party, bringing lots of water and nitrogen to the mix. Earth's atmosphere was becoming quite the party. But here's the funny thing. There was no oxygen to be found during the second experiment. Nope. Not a single breath of it. The oxygen that was produced by the sun's rays splitting water molecules got gobbled up by chemical reactions faster than you can say, oxy-bummer. It wasn't until Earth's third experiment came along, life, that things started to change. Photosynthetic organisms took center stage and used all that carbon dioxide in the air to make their food. And guess what? They released oxygen as a sidekick, Eventually, the organisms started belting out so much oxygen that it overwhelmed the reactions, and it began to fill up the atmosphere. It took a while, though, and it wasn't until about 350 million years ago that we got the oxygen levels we have today. About 21% of the air we breathe. So, from fiery volcanoes to mysterious oceans, this glimpse into the past reveals an Earth vastly different from the one we know today. It's fascinating to explore the ancient landscapes and imagine the early stages of life taking shape. Thanks to AI, we can catch a glimpse of Earth's remarkable history and appreciate the wonders of our ever-changing planet. So, stay tuned for more interesting journeys. In a frosty Canadian park, hidden deep beneath layers of thick ice, scientists discovered a bizarre skeleton they named the Frozen Dragon. The skeleton had been in the frozen ice for millions of years. It took experts decades to work out the species of this strange fossil. It was identified as a new genus of pterosaur. Pterosaurs were massive flying reptiles with wingspans of over 16 feet. Their heads were 3.5 times the size of their bodies. Pterosaurs lived 76 million years ago, 
when they soared above the dinosaurs. Scientists described them as the biggest, meanest, and most bizarre animals that ever flew. The new genus has been named Cryodragon boreus, which translates to frozen dragon of the north winds. In 2013, a young mountaineer was climbing one of the tallest mountains in Western Europe, Mont Blanc. He noticed a strange metal box poking out of the snow. The mountaineer pried the box open and found that it was filled with precious rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. The climber immediately handed the box to the authorities. It was discovered that the box likely belonged to a passenger on one of two flights from India that crashed into the mountain over 50 years ago. The box was valued to be worth over $200,000, and authorities are still searching for the heir to the small box of treasures. In northwest Siberia in 2007, a reindeer herder was on an outing with his sons when he noticed something strange in the ice. The man realized it was a frozen mammoth calf and immediately contacted the local museum. The calf was named Luba and was the best preserved mammoth mummy in the world at the time of its discovery. Luba had been in the ice for 41,800 years and is around 30 to 35 days old. From trunk to tail, the mammoth calf is roughly the same size as a large calf. If you're interested in seeing for yourself, Luba travels to museums all around the world. On the frozen continent of Antarctica, covered in layers of ice and snow, is Mount Erebus, the frozen volcano. The volcano was discovered in the middle of an eruption in 1841 by explorers on an Arctic expedition. The volcano is over 12,000 feet tall and has been active for the last 1.3 million years. Deep within the middle of the volcano is a huge crater filled with large volumes of molten lava. The volcano has occasional explosions, which means it's classified as being in continuing eruption. However, these eruptions are nothing to worry about because they're generally rather small. Back in 1991, two hikers were traveling across the Italian Alps when they stumbled across a body that they presumed to belong to a recently lost hiker. The duo trudged back down the mountain to report their unfortunate findings. Once the remains were recovered, it was clear that the body was not recent at all. Scientists determined that the Iceman was more than 5,000 years old and named him Otzi. The discovery was unlike anything scientists had ever before seen because the body was so well preserved. For years, Otzi was studied by scientists who discovered that our ancestors have a lot more in common with us than we ever knew before. Otzi was covered in ink body art Research done on the contents of his stomach revealed that his last meal was dry cured meat, similar to the bacon we eat today. Otzi has at least 19 relatives living today, somewhere in Central Europe. Scientists were researching ancient squirrel burrows in Siberia when they came across something interesting. One of the squirrels had hidden away precious seeds deep beneath the ground. The seeds had been encased in ice for 32,000 years. The seeds were for the flower Silene stenophilia, which had long since gone extinct. Amazingly, scientists were able to recover plant tissue from inside the seeds and grow an entire crop of flowers. They've since reintroduced the previously extinct flower to natural habitats all across the world. In 1930, a team of Norwegian scientists sailed around the Arctic Ocean, conducting research on the seas and glaciers. They reached White Island, a dangerous and icy land no human had set foot on before, or so they thought. The scientists were shocked to discover the tip of a small boat sticking out of the snow. Frozen inside the boat, they found scientific equipment and various personal items, including a jacket monogrammed S.A. Andre. They had discovered the wreck of the famous Andre Arctic Balloon Expedition. In 1897, Swedish explorers, led by Andre, attempted to travel to the North Pole by hydrogen balloon. No one had ever heard from them ever again. People only found out what happened to them when the wreck was discovered 33 years later. It turns out that the balloon had crashed on White Island only two days after departing from Sweden. The explorers traveled along the island on a small makeshift boat, but were unable to make it any further. 
The best preserved woolly mammoth ever found was discovered in an area of permafrost in Siberia in 2010. Scientists named the frozen mammoth Yuka after the small village near where it was found. Yuka had been frozen for 39,000 years and is thought to have been around 6 to 8 years old. Because Yuka is so well preserved, it has been studied for years and provided new information about mammoths. In 2019, scientists reported that they were able to activate cells taken from Yuka's tissue. Maybe one day, we'll have woolly mammoths roaming the land. From looking at pictures and videos of Antarctica, the continent appears to be freezing cold, covered in snow, and flat, except for a few small hills. Scientists believe that too. When studying the Gumbertsev Mountains in the early 2000s, they were shocked to discover that the small rocky hills were actually the peak of a gigantic mountain formation under a mile of snow. Using radar technology, researchers worked out that the mountains are really around 10,000 feet tall and sprawl across 750 miles. This is around the same size as the European Alps, except hidden under tons of ice and snow. At a gold mine in Siberia, a businessman was examining a nearby river when he noticed something interesting in the frost. It was a small woolly rhino calf that was later named Sasha. The woolly rhino has been extinct for 15,000 years. It's thought that Sasha could have been frozen in the ice for up to 39,000 years. Sasha is unique because it's the only full-body woolly rhino to have ever been discovered. Glaciers around the northern Italian town of Palo have begun to melt. Artifacts from decades and even centuries ago have been discovered pouring out of the ice. Personal belongings from soldiers have been found, things like diaries, photographs, and even love letters. Historians have even uncovered an entire cabin preserved beneath the ice. The cabin was filled with hard metal helmets and clothes. In 1845, Sir John Franklin embarked on an ill-fated expedition to the North Pole. The crew traveled on two ships, HMS Erebus and the ironically named HMS Terror. The expedition met with disaster and both ships were lost to the icy waters. In 2016, the HMS Terror was discovered by a team of researchers. Despite being lost for 170 years, the freezing cold waters had maintained the ship in pristine condition. Scientists described the ship as frozen in time. Dinner plates and glasses were still on shelves, beds and desks were still in order, and even the passengers' luggage appeared to be in good condition. The HMS Erebus was also discovered nearby, but due to changing water conditions, the ship wasn't in great shape. The glacial ice surrounding a mountain passageway in Norway that was notoriously used by the Vikings has revealed hundreds of ancient artifacts. One of these artifacts was a giant unopened wooden box that was welded together. Researchers were beside themselves with anticipation, waiting to open this box. They believed it would be filled with Viking treasures or artifacts that would give us an insight into ancient society. When they opened the box, all that was inside was a plain old beeswax candle. It turns out that this box wasn't actually as old as they thought it was. By analyzing the candle, they discovered that the box dates back to the 17th century. The age of the Vikings had ended by the 11th century. It's likely that the candle box belonged to a farmer who was shipping it from his summer farm to his winter farm to light up the long nights. <laughs>